Good morning, everyone. I want to welcome you all to um, this municipal management and leadership breakfast. Um, again, my name is Erin Wortman. I am the president of the Metropolitan Area Planning Council, and I'm so thrilled everyone has uh, taken some time this morning to share their thoughts, their um, insight, and all their great um, knowledge with us today. Uh, MAPC is committed to building a more sustainable and equitable region with critical partners such as yourself. The pandemic has shown us how important the role of local government is for health, safety, and prosperity of all our residents. Like you, MAPC has had to shift in order to respond to COVID-19 in supporting our municipal and other partners as we continue to rebuild. And at the same time, we are creating a new long-term regional plan called Metro Common 2050. And this plan will help our region chart a course to 2050 and will include actionable policy recommendations. Many of these recommendations, unsurprisingly, are designed to provide our municipalities the tools and resources they need to reach our region's goals together. So today we will share some specific draft policies that we want your feedback on. We want you to be you know, um, as uh, transparent as you're comfortable in being. Um, I work in local government. I, I have lots of feedback myself um, and I'm sure you all do as well. So as municipal leaders, uh, your support and insight will be crucial to making sure we get these recommendations right because frankly, we are all going to be the ones implementing these policy changes or this progress as we work toward a more equitable, sustainable future. So uh, with that, um, I'd like to hand it off to our executive director, Mark Drayson. Um, unfortunately, uh, like most of you, uh, my schedule is very full this morning, so um, I'm not cutting out because I uh, don't want to participate in conversation, but I do want to take one minute to thank you all again for taking time. We have a big group today. I'm so excited that you're all here um, and your uh, participation is so important in this process. So um, Mark, our executive director, take it away. Erin, thank you very much. And I too want to thank everybody for, for joining us. We're up to 66 people now, which is really fantastic, especially considering the weather and how difficult it was to drive to this event today. Um, you know, it's been, it, it's been a heck of a 10, 11 months so far. I know I felt it very deeply yesterday. I did something I haven't done since the 16th of March. I actually spent three hours working in the office. Uh, and, uh, and it was lonely in there. Uh, but it, it was also honestly kind of nice to be back just briefly. Uh, I had some documents to sign and a few other things that, that had to be done there. Uh, and I know that this, is, this has been a very difficult time for all local officials. You're running around, you're dealing with emergencies, you're dealing with crises. In many cases, you're trying to work on things that you never expected you would need to work on and have, have no particular training to do. Uh, and yet you're learning it, you're figuring it out. We've seen just an unprecedented accomplishment by local officials and honestly unprecedented cooperation. There's a lot of talk in this region about how, you know, individual communities put up the fences and don't work together across municipal lines. And honestly, we haven't seen any of that over the course of the last 10 months. Everybody's trying really hard to pull in one direction, even if we don't always know exactly where that direction will lead us. And uh, my staff, uh, my Metro Common staff, led by Eric Hove and many of the folks on the screen, have had a difficult task during this period of time too, uh, because they have had to try and get people to focus on a long-term regional plan at a time when everybody is worried about next Tuesday. And uh, I just hope that this morning and through this process, we can all remember that it is important to spend five, 10% of the time thinking about the long-term future, thinking about what's gonna happen five, 10, 15 years down the road thinking about the fact that we're all doing this work for our kids, for our neighbors, for our communities, 
And that requires some thought about what's happening, not just next week, but over the long term. We know this pandemic uh, is going to create some long lasting changes. Some of them could be dislocating. We also know that over this period of time, we've engaged in critical national conversation and sometimes conflict over racial equity in this country and in this region. Uh, both of those issues are going to change us in ways we can't yet determine. But as I always say to my staff and to many of you, the important thing is to recognize that that, that future doesn't just have to happen to us. We have agency over it. We have maybe not complete, but some ability to figure out what it will be like by talking about it, by researching it, by writing it down, and by setting goals, by enabling ourselves to deal equally well with differing scenarios, even when it's hard to predict exactly which one will happen, we can have some say over what life is like for all of us 5, 10, 15, 20 years down the road. That takes effort. It takes putting sometimes the things that you're working on right this moment aside for a little while to think about the future. And it requires us to set some policy recommendations that are intentionally bold, even to suspend disbelief when we think, well, that can't happen or that can't happen. Uh, remember that over time, it can happen. And with effort, joint effort, it can happen. So our team has put together a great list of preliminary recommendations. I look forward to sitting back and listening to the comments that all of you have, things to add, things to change, new ways to look at things from your own local perspective working in local government, either as elected or appointed officials. I wanna thank you so much for taking the time to be here. Recognize this part of the continuing conversation. The recommendations will not be final until the end of June. So we have a good period of time. And again, I wanna thank you for your, especially your thoughtfulness and contributions. I think I'm turning it over to Emily. <clears throat> Thank you, Mark. Can everyone give me a thumbs up if you can see the screen? Wonderful, thank you. Well, um, thank you, Mark. And I just also wanna reiterate, um, thank you to everyone who um, joined us today. What is Metro Common? I, I'll reiterate what uh, Aaron said. It is Greater Boston's next long range regional plan. Um, it really guides the work of our agency and it helps the 101 cities and towns in Metro Boston envision the future together share common challenges, search for common solutions, um, create a vision for what we want for 2050, and um, includes concrete steps to get us there. Two and a half years ago, we kicked off this initiative with you, actually, with municipal leaders. Uh, we went around the region, we had eight breakfasts. Um, I'm sorry, today does not include some breakfast, but we did do a donation, um, and I hope, hopefully you have a nice breakfast in front of you. Um, but we started with you because you are sort of the uh, most important implementers to Metro Common. Um, a year ago, we also gathered some of you to talk about, um, you know, government um, and, and, and work, workforce, workplace. And today we talk about action. So we're going to be presenting some recommendations and policies around what we call dynamic and representative government. But before we get started, uh, I do want to hear what you think of when you hear dynamic and representative government. So if you would humor us um, and please use the chat box and share a couple of things that you think of, whether it's one word or a phrase uh, of what you think of when you hear dynamic and representative government. So I'll let you guys add a few things in. a moment. All right. I'm reading a couple of these. So um, I'm seeing proactive, engaging, responsive to residents, um, agile and inclusive public engagement, nimble, inclusive, transparent. Yep, a couple more flexible, progressive, responsive to community needs, dynamic, <laughs> means government isn't the same tomorrow as it was yesterday. Thank you, Mark. Data-driven, effective, bringing younger and more representative members. Wonderful. Governed where the government where the governed aren't paying are paying attention. Yep. All right. So um, I'll let you continue to put in 
your comments. And I'm going to kick it off um, to one of my colleagues to tell you what we think of when we think of dynamic government. Um, I, I think you know Mark Fine. He's been working with many of you on COVID response and recovery, and he's the director of municipal collaboration. Mark puts the dynamic and dynamic government. So uh, take it away. Uh, well, hopefully I will. Um, <laughs> yeah, no, thank you for all those suggestions too. I think they dovetail with a lot of the way we were thinking about it. So those look great. We might steal some of your words as we put further thought into our ideas. But let me talk about you know, what, what we've meant when we envision, envision a more dynamic and representative governments in our region. You know, first, uh, dynamic and representative governments are forward-looking, collaborative, adaptable, and inclusive. And that, I think, speaks to some of the, the, the comments that you all made. Now, I imagine a lot of you haven't been able to think a week ahead in the current crisis, much less 10 or 20 years ahead. But I actually think, and, and Mark mentioned in his opening, that the COVID crisis has shown a level of collaboration, adaptability, and inclusion, both between municipalities and between sectors, like we haven't really witnessed, frankly, frankly ever. Uh, the crisis has forced us to be creative, forced local governments to do things they were never asked to do, and largely they've done it. And I think the challenge in looking ahead will be applying what we have learned and what has worked and hasn't to address other complex challenges from concentrated poverty to climate adaptation or, or even future pandemics. You know, second, uh, dynamic and representative governments facilitate creative, mutually beneficial partnerships across government and with non-government entities that can positively shape our future and the interests of all the people in the region. The regional and local governments don't need to provide every service or meet every challenge themselves, but I think they are best positioned to bring together the parties that can meet those challenges. You know, third, they ensure vital assets from our rails or road systems, our water services and parklands, our health centers and schools and public sector workforce are invested in and managed effectively and sustainably on behalf of the people of Greater Boston. And you know, also in the face of expected economic, technological, and climate change. And over the second half of the 20th century, the region and local governments largely ceded responsibility for managing and funding vital regional assets to the state and federal level. You know, that was fine when the federal and state governments were willing to fund these areas well. It does not work when they aren't, which has been more true in the first two decades of the 21st century. So I pose this question, you know, can we pin the region's future on a divided Washington or risk averse state leaders? You know, regaining a level of control and financial wherewithal at the regional and local levels certainly needs to be on the table. You know, and lastly, dynamic and representative governments provide meaningful opportunities for the people in our region most affected by the decisions of government at each level to have an active role in shaping those decisions and particularly ensure that people and communities who have not traditionally been afforded a strong voice in government are engaged and employed at all levels of leadership and decision-making. You know, maybe some wouldn't agree, but I think there's a profound imbalance between who makes decisions in our region and who is affected by those decisions. And we need to think about how to remedy that deficit. And just food for thought before we share, you know, some of our policy recommendations. The 101 cities and towns in the MAPC region collectively spent more than 14 billion in FY 2019. You know, 14 billion in, in FY 2019. You know, together, your municipalities employ nearly 180,000 people or around 10% of the region's workforce. You know, so much rides on good local government and good regional government, and the sector needs a bigger voice in, in shaping the region's future. So now I'll talk about some of our policy recommendations, uh, you know, and, and consider some of the policies that could help get us, you know, towards our vision. We identified four strategies to do that. You know, the first is improving regional coordination and partnerships for infrastructure and services. The second is expanding and improving the way we finance local and regional government. The third is improving local capacity to deliver and ensure excellent service delivery. And finally, making regional and local government more participatory participatory and inclusive. So improving regional coordination and partnerships for infrastructure and services. You know, one strategy to achieve this is to give regional and local officials and residents more say in shaping services and infrastructure. You know, for example, we can ensure local government a stronger voice on all boards of regional organizations. 
You know, I'd love to see, for example, municipal leaders select board members for the MBTA and MWRA, for example. You know, another strategy could be to create new regional entities with the authority to effectively shape services, you know, governed again or, you know, by or in concert with local leaders and area residents. You know, maybe we, we could create a Greater Boston Regional Housing Board to give the region a say in major housing developments. Housing is a regional need and does it make sense to allow it to be constrained solely by local decision making? And lastly, we want to reshape service provision in key sectors, such as health and education. You know, like I said, even if local governments don't provide services directly, such as in healthcare or, or higher education, it doesn't mean that such vital sectors shouldn't have a local or regional voice in their planning and governance. And such institutions should be obligated to contribute more financially, but potentially in other ways too, to meet the needs of people in their home region. You know, they may have global reputations, but they need to do more to think, pay, and act locally to thrive in the long term and help the region thrive. The COVID crisis, you know, certainly has made me think a lot about our fragmented health system and more local voice and how it is governed so it meets local needs could help. You know, and I would say the same for, you know, higher education, uh, you know, and we, you know, in ensuring that area institutions of higher learning invest in and support the region more than they do today. Now, of course, if we are going to improve regional coordination and local capacity, we need to tackle finance, both regional and local. You know, in, so, we, so we have been working on, on municipal finance, of course. And in this work, we have had a really great partner in the Collins Center. You know, Mike Ward and Sarah Concanon from Collins have done some really terrific work with us on this issue, and, and they're on the call today. And they've been conducting a thorough assessment of the regional and local finance systems. And we asked Collins to look at three specific things. You know, one was sufficiency. Do we have enough money to meet existing and future needs? I imagine you can predict that answer. Resiliency and sustainability, are revenues predictable and, and reliable? I mean, one observation is that while the reliance on property taxes in our state for local revenue has downsides, you know, they are not as affected by economic fluctuations as income or sales taxes, for example. You know, not a bad thing in the current crisis. We also asked them to examine questions of equity. You know, do existing and proposed revenue and financing mechanisms exacerbate disparities between municipalities and negative, negatively affect communities of color or low-income households? Obviously, even if stable, we know property taxes do not provide all communities uh, in the same way, provide for all communities in the same way or at the same level. We also know property taxes are regressive and can exacerbate inequality. So Collins is still finalizing this work, but through it, we have started to consider some recommendations in this space, such as you know, regional rev revenue solutions and coordinating investment decision-making at the regional level you know, by actors from the region. You know, more flexibility on Proposition 2.5, you know, for example, by exempting certain costs or allowing more you know, attuned inflation adjustments. You know, more funding obligations from major nonprofit entities you know, like, like healthcare and, and, and higher education and cost containment flexibility, you know, whether it's pension consolidation, healthcare cost containment and or collective bargaining and arbitration reform. Now, none of those recommendations are politically easy to address and we know that, but getting to the system we have was not easy either and the status quo is untenable. And I know you may be thinking how on earth can local government do more than it already does and with that thought, I will pass it over to my colleagues, Brian and Emily, to talk about local capacity and participation. Thank you. Over to Brian. Hi, everybody. Um, my name is Brian, and today I'd like to talk to you about the ways in which we can improve local capacity service delivery by providing just a brief overview of some of the strategies and actions that we've identified. Uh, our first uh, strategy is enabling uh, local government to attract and retain a creative, adaptive, and inclusive workforce for the long term. Uh, one opportunity that municipal government can expand is long-term workforce development and planning. Some studies estimate that up towards the 40% of state and local staff are eligible to retire in the next five to seven years. Kind of dubbed the silver tsunami, it's a large challenge, but it also presents a great opportunity for, to revitalize our work staff and create a tech-savvy, uh, creative um, workforce of young professionals. Uh, a policy. And if you look at the Metro Boston area, we're one of the most educated regions in the world. If, you, if, you, uh, if we do a better job of tapping into that workforce and ensuring that we provide young professionals what they need to thrive in a career in local government, we'll be much more positioned, much better positioned for the future. 
And uh, now I know this seems a little bit anecdotal, but one of the things that we've uh, we've looked at is is um, is creating um, internships or apprenticeships with local students. Now we've all gotten our start here uh, in local government in different ways, whether that be as a lifeguard at the local pool, making some cash over some occasion, or you know being a elected the town's first manager or being elected to a border commission. Uh, it's a bit anecdotal, but uh, I got my first start in the town of Windsor, Connecticut, and I'm not the only one to start the local government in that way. So one action that we've been looking into is ensuring that all local governments are enabled to offer internships or apprenticeships and, and even partnering with each other to offer those internships and, and get more young professionals interested in careers in local government. Second um, policy strategy we've looked at is um, focusing on inter uh, information technology. One of the major ways in which local government has been to transform over the last 10 years, especially in the last 10 and 11 months has been the expansion of tech tools and online offerings. But this strategy goes beyond buying the newest software that gets pitched to you over at MMA on the trade floor or allowing your residents to buy a dog permit online. This is about creating effective systems for decision making and learning from each other. For preparing uh, and embracing the tech age that we're allowed into now, um, local governments must be more adaptable and agile. And we need to ensure that our municipalities are IT competent and have the resources to leverage their IT assets and infrastructure and bring together a level of service to residents it's up to today's standards, but also prepare for what's coming ahead. Uh, and third, to catalyze our creative collaboration, problem solving and partnerships within municipal governments and with other sectors. We all provide very similar services in very different ways, but they're all similar services and we need to start being creative on how we look at longstanding municipal departments and how local services are provided. We need to encourage each other and encourage the nonprofit and private sectors to support traditionally local priorities and build relationship. We need to start looking beyond municipal borders for those answers. Uh, with that, I'll pass it off to Emily. Thank you. So uh, where Mark talked about a regional um, approach and Brian talked about you know local ca uh, capacity of municipalities, uh, I would like to talk to you about the people part, um, the part that I love the most. Um, I think some of you actually said at the beginning, when you think of dynamic um, and inclusive government, representative government, you think about uh, the residents and um, how to be proactive, how to be engaging, how to understand from the ground up um, is what I heard, how, how to be community led. Um, and so I'll just share with you this summer, we had some focus groups talking to residents from around the region and many people said they would like to be more involved in government but weren't quite sure how. So this first strategy talks about expanding pathways for engagement, you know, what are those pathways? You know, how do we, how do we expand them? Um, one action that we can dig deeper into when we get into the breakouts is to discuss the role of community-based organizations. Municipalities um, can certainly work to strengthen their relationships with their communities and uh, connect with community-based organizations more. They have deep relationships, they have staff to maintain those relationships and are certainly an important part of our community's civic infrastructure. So how do we make CBOs have more of a formal role or partnership? How do we fund them? How do we contract with them? By creating more partnerships, um, cities and towns could expand their outreach and engage residents that otherwise may not participate in local planning and develop in um, planning and development processes. In this section, strategy two, we also talk about enhancing resident influence and representation in local decision making. We've been working with a lot of town meetings um, and, and seeing sort of people, uh, especially the past eight, eight months, nine, 10 months, um, be very, um, you know, adapt, adaptive to, to making sure those decision making processes are, are happening. Um, and, and we learned a lot about, we were thinking about participatory budgeting, thinking about those boards and commissions and, and how to increase, um, uh, increase more, more and diverse folks into boards and commissions. And lastly, uh, creating a more diverse municipal workforce. Over the summer, MAPC released a piece of research the diversity deficit, municipal employees in Metro Boston. Um, and we can add the link in the chat. It reiterates the importance of having a government that reflects the demographics of its constituents. And in the report, there are some actionable recommendations. One key one, which is to have municipalities survey their employees and compare their age, gender, and racial and ethnic distribution uh, to the residents they serve. This data would be collected following a standard that allows for comparison across the region. By collecting this data, it will help determine specific tactics that could be pursued to promote racial equity in the municipal workforce 
and measure progress towards uh, achieving this goal. Um, so there's a lot more to say for this one as I, I haven't even talked about sort of tech advancements, um, but I will leave that for the focus groups. All right, so uh, what we would like to do now um, is we really want to actually spend the rest of the time uh, breaking up into small groups, discussing some of the actions that uh, Mark and Brian mentioned. Um, these are the seven that we, you know, we mentioned. So these would be great to dig into and have deeper conversations on. Uh, and so we wanna know what your initial reactions are. Uh, did we get this right? Where should we adjust? Where are the gaps? You know, what other policies should we be thinking about? How, how could this policy impact your work, your municipality? And how, the, how does this really relate to the challenges that you're facing uh, or the opportunities that you see? All right, so Sasha is going to be placing us into hopefully geographic. We're trying our best to get everyone into uh, sort of geographic uh, breakouts. Um, so I'm just going to do a quick check with her. Uh, we'll have about 40 minutes in our breakouts. You'll have MAPC staff facilitating um, and taking notes. And then hopefully we'll get back together before we close to share some of the points that were raised. All right, and I think I can stop sharing my screen. Um, all right, so quickly, I would just like to hear some insights from some of the groups. If someone would like to volunteer something that came up this morning. And if you don't volunteer, I might call on you. So, <laughs> yep, go ahead. I'll go. This is Yolanda. Um, I was in the Metro West Regional Group. I'm from Ashland, I'm on the select board. Um, so we had a lot of lively discussion and a couple of things that came out was uh, participatory government trying to keep Zoom in use after we get out of the pandemic. And with that, allowing possibly looking at, instead of having your quorum have to be in the room, could your quorum be those included that are participating remotely? Um, looking at how can we do town gov open town meeting in a more relaxed, not relaxed way, but a way that people can participate, maybe not have to sit there for the two hours, but how can we still have town meeting but allow people to attend via Zoom and watch things and then come in and vote. Uh, it was, uh, we talked a little bit about transportation issues and I, I was, I volunteered at the end, so I don't have full notes. Um, but also looking at our region and how can our region work more closely together either in regards to generating revenue so that as we do a project the whole region can benefit from it but the whole region participates um, with you know some type of revenue generating and then um, it was it was brought up possibly a land value tax as a way to increase revenue and then we had a, a, a quick discussion about two and a half and how it's used and not used wonderful thank you yolanda i You're see welcome. katie has her hand up katie reed i was in the magic group and we began and ended uh, with the lack of transparency at the state government level and how we could maybe work um, regionally to put pressure on that group to um, change their rules. Uh, we also talked about uh, trying to regionalize um, various things, but and uh, and some of the impediments that there are to um, affordable housing, the the definition of affordable, uh, how people miss understand what that all means. And we talked, I learned a new term and I don't know if you all know it, but uh, the banana, the build absolutely nothing anywhere near anything, uh, which is um, replacing the NIMBY. And I, I had to have actually, um, uh, let me see, where is he? Sorry, I forgot his name. <laughs> um, write it out for me because I, I didn't remember all, the whole thing the first time, but I think it's a really wonderful term that we should all be introducing into our towns because I think um, it's a really great, great concept. Thank you, Kate. Maybe someone from the North Shore. Sure. 
Sure, I could go. This is Greg Federsville from Manchester. Um, so we also talked about the, uh, the need for hybrid Zoom meetings when we get back in person that uh, people commented about how participation levels have, have gone up dramatically um, with Zoom and that people will continue to demand that and the MAPC can continue to be a resource for communities and how best to manage that uh, would be great. Um, we also talked about the perennial problems of, of, uh, of the, uh, pro uh, the procurement laws and how that's an area where some relief there would, would save the community's money. So it's not always about getting more revenue if we could lower some of our costs. And you know, when you talk about prevailing wages to someone in town, they sort of look at you like you know, you've got horns on your head or something. What, what, what is that all about? So there's a need for, um, for some changes there. Um, so those were a couple of the topics. And we also talked about um, uh, feeding the pipe for municipal employees and, and making sure we're recruiting uh, both at the higher education level, but also with internships and apprentices, but also with our vocational schools and making sure that they have tracks for, for the trades, for your DPW staff, uh, running our water plants and our sewer plants, you know, getting, getting much harder to fill those positions. And, um, those are those are good jobs, and we should be promoting those um, through our vocational schools. So those are some of the comments that we uh, that we had. Great, thank you, Councillor O'Malley. Um, our group we talked about um, improving you know, access to education, particularly civic education. Uh, we think it's crucial to having a representative gov uh, government. Uh, we also talked about um, trying to get more stringent ethics um, laws for local officials. Um, because we do think it um, it gets in the way of a lot of the progress that we are trying to make regionally. Great, and then maybe someone from the South to Southwest group. <laughs> I'll, I'll jump in, I guess. I, I'm very impressed with the different breakout groups. Sorry, Cor Corey Evans from the Cohasa Select Board. I'm impressed with a variety of discussions that the breakout groups had. Uh, and you know, our group talked about a lot of things, but I think it's fair to say one of the overarching themes uh, was how we take advantage of the benefits of regionalization um, in affordable housing and attracting talent, a variety of things. But really, on a, on a macro level, moving away from just using regionalization as a reaction to specific problems and using it as a planning tool. Um, and that's something that all our communities really thought we could benefit from, but you know, thought there were a lot of challenges to getting there. Great. And then I'll just take one more um, from the North Suburban Plus group. We had a couple of other geographies in there. Maybe Austin, if you're still on the line, I know you're very passionate. Jeez, you got to throw me under the bus like that. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so we talked about a few different things. Um, in terms of regional stuff, um, I was talking with my general passion, bringing up my, my favorite book, Metropolitan Revolution, about it. Um, we have an example currently that's just kind of coming up. Um, that Mark Fine worked with uh, Ruvier, Chelsea, and Winthrop on uh, for a regional climate and energy office that's going to be working out of Chelsea. Got money with the Bar Foundation from that. Very exciting. Um, Winthrop is involved in a regional dispatch with uh, Revere as well, and we're trying to recruit additional members as well. Um, I am adamant that the only way that uh, we're going to be successful in this region is working together. Um, I constantly bring up the, and I said this before, uh, 351 communities, 351 dog licenses. This is a waste of time. Um, I don't understand why we do it this way. Um, we, we're cutting our legs out from under us sometimes, and we're making significantly more work for our staff than is necessary if we were to consider regionalizing things. And um, when I talk about regionalizing things, it's not one department or another. There are a fair amount of things that um, if we did and shared resources on, um, bring up conservation committee type of work, um, a fair amount of larger level planning work, things like that, we could do together. Um, it doesn't really make sense that we have uh, me, for example, one person in the health department trying to deal with a pandemic. Um, this is, we have clear, clear examples from the past year of why doing it one community um, at a time doesn't work. So um, basically any regional efforts to work on, I'm always supportive of. Um, there are clear examples. I bring up uh, Indianapolis incorporated the entire county, uh, Camden, New Jersey, 
see what they did with their police department. There are recent examples all over the country of regionalization working. Um, I don't know if it's going back to the county government in uh, the state of Massachusetts. I don't think there's ever going back to that, but um, there should be a path forward where we're working together instead of having to work on our individual projects and then fighting over the eventual money that's available for it. Um, so those are my thoughts. All right, thank you everyone for sharing. And Rebecca, if you can take us home and I'll put up a slide. Yeah, well, thank you, Austin, for that passion. I think I'm gonna take you out on the road with me. Um, you know, I, I've been working on this work, thinking about how we can work together as a region now for well over 10 years. And, you know, I'm just so inspired, I think, by the passion of the energy. You know, I think we've all seen the pandemic has laid bare so many different things, but I'm hopeful that maybe there's some energy from that to really move forward in a reformation of, of government and being able to provide better services uh, to our citizens. So I just want to thank everyone for joining us today. I, I've been so inspired by the, the level of conversation and the really thoughtfulness and thoughtful ideas that you've all put forward. Um, I also want to take a moment to thank all the staff that have worked so hard on this process, all of the policy writers and sub-regional coordinators who kind of have taken a lot of time to think about, you know, what do we want the future to look like? I really hope that you guys will all continue to engage in the process. We're going to be having a number of other focus groups focused on our other policy areas. So there'll be other opportunities to engage. And then, you know, excitingly, we're wrapping up Metro Common this summer. Um, and so hopefully you can all join us for some sort of celebration, probably virtual, um, as we wrap up the plan and then really, really rely on all of you as we work through implementation over the years to come. So. Thanks for joining us today. It's, it's been great to see everyone.